the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And verse six, going down to verse six. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For that he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. With your permission, I want to reread verse 6. Reread verse 6. And I ask us to, to really consider what the Lord is saying to us. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, that is, to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, if you'll turn with me your Bibles to Psalm 27. Psalm 27, and we're just going to take a look at Psalm 27 together tonight. I want to read the first four verses first. This is a Psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Have you ever wondered why God speaks of David as a man after his own heart? Why would God speak of David in that way? I remind you, if you've studied the scriptures, you'll know that when God made that statement to Samuel, David was only about 15 years old. He was not yet a man. But God looked at him and God said, I have found a man after my own heart. That speaks volumes to me as I've read and studied on it. It tells me that God not only sees me today, but he sees me all the way down the line. He knows me as he's told us. He knows all about us. He knew when we were being formed in our mother's womb. All of our members were already written in his book. Okay. He already had our name there before we were ever named. He knew all about us. And so he says, because he knew all about David, he knew what David would be, what he would do. And so he said, I have found a man after my own heart. Why do you suppose God sees that in David? Well, do you remember when King Saul quit following God? He turned away from God and started going his own way, doing his own thing, not doing what God had told him to do. And God said to Samuel, it has repented my heart that I made him king. And I'm taking the kingdom from him. Okay. When Samuel, or Saul came to Samuel, Samuel asked him, what is going on? You were supposed to wait for me. And he said, oh, we, we waited, but we got worried because you didn't show, so we, I sacrificed and we went in. And he said, you were supposed to kill everything, all the animals, everything. He said, we did. And Sam said, what is this bleeding of sheep that I hear? Folks, you can't hide from God. You can't hide anything from God. So then Saul had to make an excuse. He said, oh, well, we kept the best of them to offer as a sacrifice to God. 
I love what Samuel's answer is. To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey. So what did God know about David? You notice Samuel, or pardon me, you notice Saul did not repent. He didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't acknowledge I was wrong, I sinned. No, he wouldn't do any of that. But whenever David sinned, what did he do? Immediately he went before God, asking for forgiveness. When he sinned that great sin with Bathsheba and having her husband killed, when the prophet spoke to him and told him a little story, David got angry and he said, that man, and Samuel said, you are the man. You sinned. And David acknowledged right away. He didn't make excuses. He didn't try to weasel out of it, to why he had to do that. Immediately he sought God, broken before God. God knew when he spoke that of David, that David would always have a repentant heart and seek him. So David said, God said, David's a man after his own heart. So let's consider the 27th Psalm together. Verse 1, David knew where he was in God. Listen to verse 1 again. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You see, David knew his relationship with God. He knew who God was. He knew what he was supposed to do. And there was no fear or doubt about his relationship with God. He was totally confident that he belonged to God and that he was serving, serving God. He said, the Lord is, look at it again. The Lord is, David says, the Lord is. I love that. Then he goes on to talk about what the Lord is to him. I wonder tonight, have you ever just sat down and got quiet before the Lord and just begin to think on the Lord? Begin to think on some of the things that he's done for you? Begin to praise him and acknowledge to him, Lord, you are the Lord, my God, my God. Are you secure in the fact that God is our God, that he's your personal God? He's not just God out there somewhere. No, he's our personal God. Right here with us, right beside us. And David was thoroughly convinced of it. Okay, listen to what he said. The Lord is. The Lord is what? If somebody asked you tonight, what is the Lord to you? What is God to you? Listen to David. The Lord is. He is my light, he is my light. That means David is acknowledged, he guides me, he directs me. He's right there with me at all times. I have nothing to fear. There's no darkness in that relationship. He is my light. Okay. He guides me, the steps the Bible tells us that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Now think about that for a moment. Every step that a righteous person takes is ordered of the Lord. God guides us. He directs us. He gives us the strength to do it. Okay, He's right there with us. Okay. David said, and my salvation. He is the Lord, my rock. He is my salvation. I don't have to look to anybody else or to anything else. The Lord is my salvation. As you think about it, David had an understanding of all that when he said the Lord is my salvation, he had an understanding of all that that comprised of. All that it meant when he said he is my salvation. Jeremiah 17, 14 says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. 
for thou art my praise. David realized that God is all of that to him. And he's that to every one of us. Salvation is an all-inclusive word, meaning all that we have now. Not only shall I be saved from my sins, but I shall be saved from all of my enemies. All of my enemies. Whom shall I fear? Let's look at it again. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Do you have that confidence tonight? You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to be afraid of anything because God is with us. God is guiding us. God is directing us. We are kept by the power of God. He he has his hand upon every one of us that are his children. David knew and understood that. He thoroughly understood it. So he said, whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I ask you to, to think of this when, you, when we talk about it. Let me remind you of the prophet Elisha. Let's take a look at 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6, and I want to begin reading at verses 8 through 18. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to that place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. In other words, more than two times. Was spoke, the word was spoken to him, and he was saved because of it. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, he knew that the plans were being leaked out, and he thought, perhaps it's one of my own men. So he calls them together and he asks them, will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. In other words, he gathered his army together and sent them to go get Elisha, to go get him. And they came by night and compassed the city about. I love the rest of this part. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth. Behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, and when his servant looked out and saw all of that, fear gripped his heart. And he ran back into Elisha. Okay? And his servant, servant said to him, Alas, my master, no, what shall we do? We're surrounded. What are we going to do? You see, he didn't have the relationship with God that Elisha had. He was afraid. But I love this. And Elisha prayed. Verse 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now I ask you, let me pause there and just ask you a couple of questions. How would you feel if you were in that situation. You walk out the door and you're surrounded by an army and they're going to take you. The enemy's going to take you. How would you feel? 
Fear grips his heart. He runs back to Elisha. And what do you think he thought when Elisha said, Fear not, for they that are with us are more than they. He just came in. There was nobody else out there except that army. And Elisha says, They that are with us are more than they that are with them. We've read our Bibles, so we know the answer. But he didn't. And listen. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about. God's army. God's army. When I read that, when I first read it, I got excited. You said, why, Pastor? Why did you get excited about that? Because that army has surrounded them. What does the Bible say is happening to us? The angels of God are encamped around and about them that fear him. In other words, those that love and respect and obey God God sent his angels to be around and about us, to protect us, to keep us. We don't see them, but they're there. They're there. I'm sure there's been many times that things have happened in your life that you escape some kind of a tragedy or some other situation. You wonder, how does this happen? The angels of God are encamped around and about them that fear him. Just like the host of God's army was round and about Elisha and his servant. God is watching out. No wonder David could say, whom shall I fear? David knew this. Whom shall I fear? I, I just praise and thank God for the fact that, that we know about this. He knew also that God's children in the battle is the, that the battle is the Lord's. Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 15 says, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by the reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. If we could just get that from here down to here. Everything we go through in life, if we belong to God, the battle's not ours. It belongs to God because he's taking care of us. We don't have to fight it. We fight it through the word of God and prayer. Remember, the Bible tells us, 2 Corinthians 4.10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of the stronghold. What are our weapons? The Bible and prayer. The Bible and prayer. Okay. You and I have the same promise. Be not afraid. The battle's not yours. It's God's. Okay. You and I have that same promise. Today, if God be for us, who can stand against us? You may be going through some hard times right now. There may be struggles that you're going through. There may be situations that, that you don't have answers for. But God does. God does. He already knows what he's going to do to take care of your situation. And when you earnestly get down before him and begin to talk to him about it. See, Isaiah 118 says... God speaking, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Think about it. Creator God saying to his creation, that's you and me. If we have situations, if we have things that are going on that we don't like, boop, pastor, something we don't like to talk to God about. If there's things in our life that we don't like, he didn't say we had to like it. He just said, trust him. Just trust him. 
Come now, let us reason together. Get alone with God. Talk to Him. Talk to Him. Tell Him what's going on in your life. Tell Him what's troubling you. Tell Him, acknowledge Him. Lord, I don't have the answer. I don't know what to do about this. God's just waiting to hear that from you. Why? Because God said, Call unto me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things that you know not of. If you're up against the wall, you've done everything you know to do, stop. Get alone with God. Take your Bible out. Sit down before him. Start praying. Start talking to him. Lord, I've got a problem. I don't know how to handle it. I don't know what to do about it. Lord, I need your help. Okay. Ask him. Ask him to give you the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding that you need for this situation. And then quietly wait for him. Quietly wait for him. Pastor, does that work? Absolutely. Absolutely. There have been many times that I've had to just quietly sit before God. Tell him, Lord, I don't have an answer for this. I don't know what to do for this situation. But you have the answer. I'm asking you to show me what to do. I mean, God's never failed me. Many situations, he's never failed me. He won't fail us if we'll trust him. If we'll truly hold on to it. Okay, Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can stand against it? David said, the Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord is the strength of my life. The Apostle Paul says to us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, getting ready to talk to us about putting on the whole armor of God. But he starts it at verse 10. And he says, and finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Trusting in the power of his mind. What does he say to us? Stop trusting in yourself. Stop trying to handle it yourself. Be strong in the Lord. In other words, he's telling us, develop a strong relationship with Jesus. A close walk with Jesus. Trust him. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Turn it over to God. He's bigger than any situation you and I will ever face. Let me run that by you again. There are a lot of situations that we're going to face in this life. There are a lot of things that we're not going to know how to handle it. But God is bigger. God is stronger than any situation that you and I'll ever face in this life. He already has the answers. He's just waiting for us to ask him. He already knows what he's going to do. Now, let me kind of talk to you about that a minute. I said he already knows what he's going to do. He's just waiting for us to ask him. When we ask him, we need to let go of it. We can't, he, he, he doesn't answer it until we let go of it, till we quit struggling with it, till we quit trying to do it ourselves. Well, Lord, I prayed about it. Now I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. No, if I bring it to the Lord, I need to leave it there. I need to let and wait for God to take care of the situation. He will answer like he promised, and he will do it. He may say, this is what you need to do, then he's telling you how to do it, what to do it, how to do it. And it's done. He takes care of it. Okay. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If we obey that and put our total trust in God, then our confidence will be like that of David. Look at verse 3. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. 
the war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. Think about it. Once I give it to the Lord, I let go of it. I need to do what Philippians 4, 6 tells us. Be anxious for nothing. That word anxious means don't worry about anything. Be anxious for nothing. But by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. I want you to notice that. He says, pray about it. Don't worry over it. Worrying won't change it. Don't worry over it. Pray about it. Supplication means make God known to God what you need. Tell him what you're needing, what it's all about. By prayer, by supplication, and it doesn't end there. You don't just say amen. No, he says, by prayer, by supplication, and by thanksgiving. Be sure we thank God for everything we ask him for. Well, pastor, I wait till I get the answer. You may never get the answer. Okay, thanksgiving. We pray, we thank him, and by thanking him, what are we doing? By thanking him, we're saying, Lord, I believe it's going to be. I'm thanking you now because as far as I'm concerned, it's done. By prayer and thanksgiving, make your request known to him. Okay. So I want you to notice David's confidence in God. The Lord is the strength of my life. Okay. He knew who God was and he knew what God could do for him. He's the strength of my life. So remember, whatever the Lord did for David, God will do for us. And the Lord in the power of his might, if we obey that and put our total trust in God, then our confidence will be just like David's. We won't worry about it. We won't fret over it. We just let go of it and let God take care of it. Some would say to me, and I've had people, when I talk about faith and trust in God, I've had people say, Pastor, how do we come to that place? How do we come to that place where we are strong in the Lord? How do I figure that out? How do I come to the place where I'm really strong in the Lord? To where I can trust Him for everything? David gives us the answer. Let's look at verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord. First off, I stop right there. I want to draw your attention to that word, desired. One thing I desired of the Lord. What does he say? Something that I really wanted from God. I wasn't window shopping. Folks, there are a lot of times, if you let me use that expression, there are a lot of times that we think we want something, or we see something, think we want it, or we might want to do something or go someplace, and we pray and then we forget about it. I call that window shopping. Now let's, let's get down to business with God. One thing I desired of the Lord, I really want it, I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. Okay that I may do well in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David wanted to be, I ask you to think about it, David wanted to be, that by saying do well in the house of the Lord, David meant to be continually in God's presence. One thing I desired, one thing I desire of the Lord, and that will I seek after. How am I going to seek after the desire to be continually in the presence of the Lord? It means then that I have to make some changes in my life. It means that I have to discipline myself to get in alone with God, with my Bible, and with prayer starting my day in his presence. 
asking him to guide me, to direct me, to go with me, to go with me throughout the day, to be my strength and my guide. Do you love him? Do you really want his presence? Okay. Or are you satisfied with the status quo? What do you mean, Pastor? Are you satisfied with just coming to church on Sunday morning or once in a while? Maybe once in a while you'll pick up your Bible and read it a bit. Or sometimes all the Bible some people get is what the pastor shares on Sunday morning or Sunday night when he's pre preaching the Word. If we're going to really desire that relationship, folks, we have to discipline ourselves to get along with God. What does he say? Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Go near to God. So David desired to know God, to really know God. I ask tonight, how much do we really want to know God? How much of God do we want in our life? You see, we determine how much of the Lord we have in our lives. Try to picture it like this. You get real thirsty and you want some water. So you get a glass, you go to the water faucet, you turn it on and you put the glass under it. You determine how much water is going to go into that glass. If you just want a little bit, you turn the water off. If you want it half full, you get there and turn the water off. If you want it running over, you just leave the water on. How much of God are you letting in? The more time you spend with him, the more of God you're going to have. The more of his presence you're going to have. How much do you want? As for me, I want, I've told you many times, but let me repeat it to you. I'm not a greedy person. I'm not. I like to give. I like to share. But there's one area where I am greedy. So what's that, Pastor? I want everything God has for me. Everything God has planned and purposed for my life, everything that he's planned to, to do with me or give unto me, I want that. I want it. God's put it there for me. How am I going to get it? Spending time with him, obeying him, and seeking him. Father, tonight I have shared the message that you have put upon my heart. I'm asking you to do tonight what only God can do. Father, I can pray over the message. I can study over it, prepare. But I cannot change a heart. I can try to preach the message but I cannot change a heart. Only you can change a heart. So I'm asking tonight, Lord, for those that are online with us tonight, I thank, thank them for joining us. Father, I'm asking you to stir a deep hunger in every one of our hearts. Those here in the sanctuary, those that are online with us tonight, Father, that you would stir a great hunger in our hearts to draw closer to you, to really prepare our hearts to seek the Lord. Touch every individual here tonight, I ask. I'm asking, Lord, that you would meet every need that is represented among us. And Father, that testimonies start coming back in of what the Lord has done for me as I begin to seek you. I ask it in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.